um, yeah, I hope everyone is doing well during all this. Um, like uh, Mir said, this was originally planned for container days, um, but I'm thrilled to have the chance to do this uh, virtually with you. So uh, since you're here, I hope you have some interest in infrastructure as code and continuous delivery. Uh, most of this will focus on AWS, um, and there will be a bit of a tie-in uh, with Kubernetes uh, along the way, since I know that this group does a lot with Kubernetes. So um, automate your infrastructure with GitOps, Terraform, and Drone. Uh, so here I am. Uh, very nice to meet all of you. I've, uh, I'm an infrastructure en engineer at Meltwater. Uh, have been for over five years now. Um, I live in New Hampshire in the USA uh, with my wife, and we have three children. And if you want to find me, uh, here I am on uh, Twitter or GitHub. So if you haven't heard about Meltwater, um, at a high level, what we do is uh, deliver the leading integrated media and social intelligence solution for public relations, communication, and then marketing departments. Um, so if you're interested, our official site is meltwater.com. Uh, we have products around media monitoring, media outreach, social listening, social publish publishing and engagement, mm. and social influencer management. Uh, we have over 30,000 30, clients around the world. Uh, these are some of the big ones you probably recognize. Uh, so the engineering organization in Meltwater is also global. So we have something like 300 engineers, uh, something like 30 to 40 teams. Uh, there are nine offices that I work with regularly. Uh, I think we have more that I couldn't remember, but you know, we have offices in India. Uh, Budapest, Berlin, Gothenburg, London. Um, I'm in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, Toronto, Raleigh, North Carolina, San Francisco. So we are distributed all over the place. Uh, lots of different time zones, uh, which kind of leads into our uh, having to come up with processes that are well adopted without a lot of um, push. Uh, it, it, we, we really rely on putting out solutions that teams will want to use and will kind of grow and spread organically because uh, you can't be face-to-face -face and, uh, and be interacting in offices very often with uh, such a distribution. So that was engineering. Um, I work with uh, what is called the foundation mission within, within engineering. So uh, our customers are the other engineers. We provide, um, you know, services, uh, tools, best practices, documentation uh, around lots of different things that help our engineers get their work done. So we are two teams, uh, one mission, but two teams, uh, one in North America and then another in Europe. So the North American team that I'm on, uh, we manage like AWS consolidated billing, we manage um, Terraform examples and uh, modules and best practices around that. Uh, the Pokemon logo, Death Star logo, whichever you prefer, is the drone logo, if you've never seen it before, which we'll talk about a bunch. Uh, Grafana, Prometheus, uh, Prometrix. So we own a bunch of these services um, that, that we help, that helps uh, engineering teams. So we, and then our counterpart team in Europe uh, manages the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, they manage things like uh, Service Mesh, that's the Istio logo. Uh, they also run an entire logging backend that most of the uh, organization applications send their logs. So we both, you know, we're part of the same mission, we're part of the same uh, goals, but we, we own separate uh, tools and, and services that uh, we, we do try to work closely together to make sure that they work seamlessly, but we have clear ownership separation. So uh, our mission statement is uh, we enable teams to accelerate without thinking too much about the infrastructure, allowing a rapid path from ideation prototype to providing business value. So finally, coming around to what we're gonna talk about today, um, GitOps. So GitOps is a buzzword, but really all we care about is that it, it means it's, that Git is the source of truth for all of our running infrastructure. Uh, we don't like uh, clicking around in consoles, launching infrastructure, um, and you know running scripts from servers, uh, manually or you know following wiki documentation to 
uh, actually launch things. We want everything to be infrastructure as code. So, uh, and then that's where Terraform comes in. <clears throat> uh, so that's what we've chosen as the, uh, the, the standard, the, the paved road for uh, all of our engineers. It's what we support, it's what we provide examples for. Uh, it's, it's pretty much expected if, if you are running, if a team is running a native address account and expects to be in our consolidated billing, they need to at least, there's a certain level of uh, Terraform they, they at least need to uh, manage and, uh, and, and process they need to follow. Uh, but beyond that, uh, they, they are able to run uh, and use their own tools. Some teams use CloudFormation, some, team use, some teams use uh, CDK. Um, all we really care about is that it's managed as code. Um, and then Drone is our internal uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery solution that uh, we've been running in production for over two years now. So uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about a bunch, a bunch about Drone now. Uh, well, actually, just a second. <laughs> so more background on why uh, we use GitOps, because um, we can just follow uh, proven software development processes because infrastructure is code is code. Uh, we, this is a solved problem, uh, developing software, and we can just kind of piggyback on, stand on the you know, shoulders of giants to uh, do things in a, in a seamless way to, uh, to manage all this infrastructure as code. Um, we can easily see differences over time because it's checked in Git. Uh, pull request checks let us know what's changing and give us an audit trail to refer back to. Um, if we're doing our pull requests well, it usually means that we can easily roll back, roll back our changes uh, by just reverting those pull requests. Um, and, uh, and another big thing for me personally is uh, that I feel our, our GitHub, we use GitHub, um, and that the organization is a, a great resource. So by just having everything in Git, I, I can go and search for a uh, Terraform resource that I maybe haven't used yet. I can find you know, I'm likely to find you know a few examples of other teams that are using that resource and and uh, and not and yeah introduce the time it'll take for me to, to learn that new thing. Uh, and then why would we use uh, Terraform? Well, it's cloud agnostic. Um, it's not specific to any one provider. Um, and there are dozens of providers: AWS, uh, Datadog, Kubernetes are a few that we use. Um, it's that important, so you make changes uh, in the UI. Maybe intentionally, unintentionally, Terraform is going to tell you about it, uh, you know, through a, a future plan that you that you that you execute. Uh, it'll it will tell you. As whereas <clears throat> some tools like uh, CloudFormation, in our experience, you know, we've there, it's possible to make changes that CloudFormation won't detect, and uh, and it won't bring your system or uh, your infrastructure back to a state where you expected it. Uh, we feel that uh, HashiCorp provides uh, some excellent documentation, and for what you can do with it, we feel it's a very uh, fairly low learning curve. That, uh, and we think it's very reasonable to ex expect our engineers to get a at least a low uh, understanding of it. And Drone for us, um, it was chosen because it's container native. Um, I'll talk a bit about runners, but Drone executes pipelines on runners. Uh, the default is Docker, so every step in your pipeline is a Docker, a running Docker container that, that's short-lived for as long as the step runs. Um, so, you know, leveraging all of uh, what Docker, Docker's capabilities um, give you is, is built right in. Uh, we're not, you know, managing servers that have to be changed for instances where there's dependencies at the OS level that teams, you know, need to, we're the blocker for teams to get their changes of you know, whatever version of software they need. Uh, they can just build whatever they need in, into their containers and it's right there in your pipeline. Um, so that kind of goes along with it being unopinionated. Uh, there's a good ecosystem of plugins. Um, a plugin in Drone is actually just another Docker container that it expects to be run in a Drone pipeline. So it gets parameters and uh, you know, environment uh, settings that, that it needs to do some things for you that uh, you wouldn't have to you know, do on your own. So like there's, there's Terraform plugins, there's Slack plugins, there's, um, there's quite a few out there that mean that you don't have to figure out uh, what to put in a pipeline step yourself. Um, these are the administration for us. So this is a production service for us. We felt it's been just rock solid uh, for the you know, over two years we've had it in production. And it, it really works for just about everything. I mean, we've seen uh, it just really take off throughout the organization. Uh, just uh, teams are using it for everything. They're using it for things we would never have thought of. I've seen teams, uh, you know, run tests 
that execute like 16 different containers, you know, three, four Elasticsearch containers, four MySQL containers, you know, all at the same time, um, doing crazy stuff we would never have thought of. And, and it works very well for everyone. Um, so more information on Drum, which uh, maybe may, might be the one tool here that uh, has released, uh, you know, it's at least known, I would expect. So the official site is drone.io. Um, free drone is free for open source projects. Uh, we are enterprise customers, so we are paying for an enterprise license. Um, there is a free cloud offering, uh, which works for public GitHub repositories. Excuse me. Which is at um, <clears throat> cloud.drone.io. So that's a nice way to try it out, um, get a feel for it before you try running it on your own. So more, uh, some more numbers um, for our internal drone service. Uh, last I checked, we had over 1,300 repositories. And to give you an idea, we have like over 3,000 GitHub repositories. Active repositories is probably a fraction of that. I mean, so I think my guess is this is probably around uh, more than half of active repositories are using Drone. And um, we have last I checked uh, over 220 users. And on average, we're running about uh, 1,000 pipelines per day. So of those uh, 1,000 pipelines, uh, what's, what I'm about to share uh, <clears throat> involves uh, 28 uh, Meltwater Terraform repositories. That are, that are following this process I'm about to share. Uh, so I checked in the past 30 days and there were 28 different repositories that had run. Um, and from those 28 repositories, there were uh, 448 actual individual pipelines that ran. So this is uh, not something that's seen just a small amount of adoption or a small amount of usage. It's, it's very heavily in use. So um, now getting into um, what this actually looks like, uh, this is what we would recommend for teams getting started where, uh, so in this case, this would be one repository with dev and prod configuration managed in that same repository. So you'd have your drone YAML uh, in the root, and then you'd start breaking things up by dev and prod. Uh, we're in AWS, so we, then we, we break things out by region. Uh, and then we start breaking things out by project or VPC or whatever you know, the team feels makes sense. Uh, default is kind of for things that would be shared throughout that region, like maybe DNS uh, uh, zones or um, users uh, for authentication, that sort of thing. So it's, this model has been really uh, helpful for us to keep, uh, keep things separate. So uh, for example, where I've mentioned uh, our team and the team in Europe, uh, we're both part of the same mission I've mentioned. Um, we use the same repository for uh, development and production between the two teams. Uh, we almost never block each other uh, it, because everything is separated out by, you know, uh, by project or by uh, service. And, and whenever one team is making a change, it's it's very rarely happening in, in the same directory uh, as another team. So this has worked well for us uh, in a distributed format. So let's jump into what the files beneath these uh, structures would look like. So we would have, um, at minimum, uh, like a, a main.tf, uh, a terraform.tf, and a terraform.version file. So I'll talk about each of those. So the terraform.tf would find at least the back end. So um, hopefully everyone has uh, maybe a basic understanding of terraform and state files, but your state file is extremely important. Uh, you do not want your state file local. Uh, it needs to be somewhere off uh, off your machine, off of wherever it's being read and written to and, and somewhere safe. So we keep it in S3 and we name our, first of all, we name our, we would set up buckets uh, for dev and prod, separate buckets for a little extra safety. Um, then we would also uh, set up the structure in the bucket to the uh, based off of the structure in the repository. So in this example, I had dev at EUS1 default, um, then that would be the dev bucket in uh, beneath the EUS1 directory and then default.tf state. 
So that's an example of uh, what our dev default uh, directory might look like. And then, so the prod default directory might look like this. So similar idea, separate uh, S3 bucket and same uh, or similar uh, directory. Oh, this is for the VPC one directory in this case, instead of default, but in prod. So uh, the next file uh, that's important is the version file. So this is how we handle uh, multiple uh, different versions of Terraform. So we don't want to be tied to one version of Terraform for the entire structure. Uh, that would be very difficult when we, were, when we wanted to move to a newer version, where <clears throat> certainly like uh, the, going from 0.11 to, to 0.12, was a big effort. Uh, it was a very hands-on process. Uh, so we would not have wanted to break everything uh, for the amount of time it took us to, to update from 0.11 to 0.12. So we, we placed these version files in each directory. Uh, and then the, the pipeline I'll share in a moment will um, actually look for these files and then use that uh, to download and run the version of Terraform that's in there. Uh, so that was dev and um, prod in as default in prod uh, VPC one, for example, like we can have a completely different version of Terraform, uh, in this case, 0 11. And, uh, and that's totally fine. We can move to that newer version whenever, you know, whenever our team can prioritize it. Uh, so the last file would be that uh, main.tf. So we, this is just a basic example. In, in real life, we probably have multiple files uh, you don't keep everything in main.tf. Um, you might wonder how, so this is, there's a lot of duplication here potentially um, between dev and prod. How do you make sure that things are staying in sync but you haven't diverged um, greatly between your dev and prod uh, configuration files without running? Um, I mean, we do use uh, like diff locally uh, on directory structures to see if uh, what we expect is different is actually different. Uh, but the big way that we reduce that complexity is through modules. So we will go and uh, make a separate GitHub repository for just our Terraform modules for our team. And uh, we'll, we'll structure those in a way like here's an, here's an example directory that um, is its own module and it has its own tag of example v2. So that, so that could be dev. Uh, and then prod could be, um, yeah, that's vpc1. That's, and then prod um, could be on v1. Uh, and then the pushing uh, whatever new version of uh, our configuration from dev to prod can just be a one line change of that tag, ideally. Probably not that way in practice all the time, but ideally it's a simple change like that. Very few. Uh, lines involved with the change of going from one environment to the next. So that was a uh, Terraform side of it. So what would the drone side of it look like? So if you haven't seen a drone YAML file before, uh, it looks, this is what the, the start of, of this would look like. Uh, kind of similar to Travis or Circle. Um, so where I had mentioned there are multiple runners earlier, uh, the, in the default is Docker. That's where the type comes in. Uh, so I'm not gonna really go into other runners too much, but just know that there are other runners. Um, you don't have to use Docker. There's, there's an exec runner, which just runs on the OS level. Um, there's a Kubernetes runner. I'm gonna mention it later. Um, so a few important pieces of the pipeline are the setting the concurrency. So we really, really, really don't want multiple Terraform runs happening in the same directory. There are ways you can prevent lock, or you can set up locking, um, which is, would be safer. But at this level, we can make things extra safe by just setting the concurrency level to one. So only one, if, if multiple commits come in for multiple people, it's gonna be one, one pipeline that has to finish before the next starts and, and so on. So um, the next important piece is that we only want it to trigger off of the master branch. If we're pushing, pushing up to other branches, uh, we don't want those pipelines to trigger until we open a pull request. And then that would uh, trigger our pull request steps. And in this case, um, I'm gonna have some steps later on where I want to share some uh, files generated between multiple steps. So I've set up a volume 
In this case, it's I named it .aws because there's a .aws directory that's going to have some credentials written uh, that I want to share. So the first step in my drone pipeline looks like this. So we need to know uh, when Terraform changes are happening, what files have changed to then know which directories to go into and run Terraform. So not only do we need to know the files changed, um, we need to know if did that change happen beneath the structure that has a Terraform version file. Sometimes we remove the Terraform version file because we don't want that infrastructure uh, brought up for whatever reason. And, and that, keep, that ensures that until that file comes back, uh, it won't be Terraformed. So um, drone then gives us some uh, helpful variables, drone commit before and drone commit after. Uh, let us uh, then pass that off to get diff to know, um, to get the list of files that have changed. Uh, then the said lines that come a little after that are a bit uh, scary looking, but they're, they're just escaped a lot. And they, the end result is that we just get a list of files, or sorry, a list of directories that have changed that have Terraform version files in them. So once we have that, now we can start going through and running Terraform. So that's, um, that's the first step in our pipeline. And it, in this example, I'm just using the official um, Alpine 3 image. The other steps I'll share um, also look similar where we're actually installing um, dependencies at the beginning. Ideally, we'd build these into an, an image and, and not install dependencies at, at uh, execution time. But uh, just so it's, it's in the example and, and clear where all these pieces are coming from. So the next thing we need to do is authenticate with AWS. So this is where we feel we've come up with a, um, a pretty uh, good solution for, for authentication that doesn't involve uh, AWS access keys and secrets. So if we had our teams you know, setting up IAM users and um, hard coding AWS uh, keys and secrets, uh, you, they can be secrets in, in, in a pipeline. But those are still, um, you know, potentially the, the keys to the kingdom. You're, you're passing those around. They could, you know, they could be used for things you don't expect, um, malicious purposes. So what we offer Teams is a way to use the instance role of our agents. Since we're in AWS, uh, it can just utilize that instance role um, to uh, obtain the uh, authorization they need into their account. And they do that um, in this example through. Um, through an external ID, which is kind of like a password for uh, when you do a role assumption in AWS. And then by just using the uh, official AWS CLI Docker image, uh, here's where I bring the uh, .aws volume in, um, set up those uh, secrets, so like the external ID. In this case, I made the account ID a, a secret also. And just some, with some AWS CLI commands, um, you can set up the uh, credentials that are needed. And then I always like to throw in AWS SCS get caller identity to prove I've actually authenticated and, and, and see that back in the log output. Uh, so the last step then would be to run Terraform. So in here, I've uh, named my step um, using a drone variable. Uh, drone supports using uh, some variables. Uh, that drone provides in the name of your step. Uh, again, I'm using the Alpine 3 image. Uh, I'm using that volume again that was uh, written to in the previous step. Uh, one thing I didn't mention yet is that uh, the workspace where your code gets checked out is a shared volume by default. Uh, you don't have to do anything extra. So if you're manipulating and writing files uh, in the workspace where your checkout is, has happened, um, you don't have to do any extra steps. That, those would be available to uh, subsequent steps in your pipeline. Uh, but in this case, because it was writing to a different directory under uh, roots directory .aws, I wanted to make that a, its own volume that got shared. Um, so here I'm using, uh, in the commands that actually run, um, a tool called tfenv. tfenv is a nice way, nice way of uh, switching between Terraform versions. Um, it's just actually some shell scripts. So I clone that repository. And, uh, and set it up in my path. Again, this would be better to have in a pre-built Docker image, but putting it all out in uh, explicit steps here so it's clear. So once we get to that point, uh, we can start iterating over that 
uh, Terraform does file that got written to in the first step. Uh, so then it's just a matter of uh, changing into those uh, directories and installing the version of Terraform that's defined in the Terraform version. Um, TFENV use, then we'll use that version. Um, Terraform init is required as the first step to download all of your modules and uh, uh, pro yeah, the other word, uh, providers. Um, and then if you're on a pull request, uh, that's a drone build event variable that becomes a Terraform plan. If you're on a push, again, that only happens on master um, because of that uh, parameter we set at the beginning, um, then that becomes an apply. So the next thing we had to do, so that example I just shared uh, would work well for one account. If you had one account where you were managing your dev and production uh, infrastructure and you were only in one region, that example would probably work well for you. Um, but that's not how we actually have our configuration. So we will actually have um, separate accounts for like development and production. So we we can we could build into our uh, sh you know shell code or, or separate scripts the the logic of figuring out what directories changed and, and what needs to happen. Uh, what we thought would be better would be to actually change the steps that run uh, in, in Drone. So we, we wrote a conversion plugin. So Drone supports um, conversion extensions. So you, Drone will go out and grab your YAML, um, download it, and then optionally pass it off to uh, another process that you define. So this process for us, where that process can then do any manipulation it wants to the YAML and then pass it back to Drone. So the manipulation we do is see what files have changed in the commit range. And depending on the rules that have been set, that, that those steps will either be um, included or excluded. So this then becomes really helpful in a Terraform um, directory structure like I've, I've been sharing, um, which we'll get into in the next slide. This is this very simple example of, uh, of what this uh, conversion extension will do for you. In this here, if that this step would only run when readme is changed. Uh, if for all other changes, it would not, it would not execute. So back to the AWS credentials example I had earlier. Uh, now it gets a bit more complex, but this will work for uh, detecting ch only changes that have happened beneath dev EUS one. And with using uh, YAML anchors, I don't know if you haven't seen YAML anchors, they're a nice, nice way of reducing uh, duplication in your YAML. Uh, so I'm using them to define a block uh, earlier and then later on the, the lower section there is, is what I then need to duplicate for any other directory structures and accounts and roles that I need to assume. Um, those can all be their own separate steps. So hopefully that makes sense. And then we would then have a similar step for Terraform um, where, yeah, like most of it gets shoved up in the anchor and then only the pieces that are uh, specific to dev EOS one uh, become their own step. Um, briefly realized I didn't mention that the, some of these variables that I've had to set, AWS metadata URL, AWS SDK load config are workarounds for a bug in the current version of the AWS uh, Terraform provider, which when, when using the EC2 instance metadata for uh, assuming the role to, to gain authentication, it, it doesn't read that correctly uh, without those variables set. So that apparently will be fixed in version three of the AWS uh, Terraform provider, so hopefully soon. Um, how about we jump into a demo of seeing how this actually works. So I have a repo here with a very similar directory structure. So default has the similar files like I was talking about. In this case, I've actually, I will share this repo after. This is all the Terraform you need on the account side to allow for that role assumption. There is some other config if you were running drone uh, um, on the, the drone server side. That's the account side that, that, that you would actually use that is being used right now for what I'm about to do. 
Um, so if I go into this uh, VPC1 directory, so here, here are those uh, main .tf, terraform, .tf, terraform, version files. Uh, in this case, um, I was in here before and I was working and when I was done, I didn't want it, uh, the infrastructure to cost me any more money. So I wanted to bring it down. Um, you, you'll notice in the pipeline steps, I didn't have to create a terraform destroy step to, to somehow figure out when files have been deleted to know uh, when infrastructure should be removed. Uh, that, that gets very, yeah, we've never uh, attempted to write a pipeline that supports that because really all you need to do is remove the configuration that you, that you want to destroy and leave behind your uh, configurations that's man managing the, the, the state. So if you do that, it's the same process of Terraform apply. Terraform apply will destroy the, 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 thing, the infrastructure for you. Um, so here, I just have the official uh, AWS Terraform module, or VPC module, um, with the example that it, that it provides. Um, and all I have to do is rename this file main.tf, or bring back to VPC one. Put that into a pull request. And watch that actually run a drone. This is the drone web interface. If you've never seen it before, each step, uh, like I was sharing in, in the previous slides, uh, ends up as its own step on the left here. Uh, this is the credential step, uh, files change step. I'll figure it out that I only changed WS1 VPC1, and I got uh, credentials I need in the next step. And now we have a plan running. That's the final step. It shouldn't take too long. Um, the, the output uh, will, yeah, here it goes. So you can collapse, you can expand and collapse all the log output. Um, it's really, it's really helpful and just simple and straightforward, whereas other tools I've found really try to do way too much in this view. So that's it. Um, I got to see all my plan output, so I can verify that's exactly what I want. Back over my pull request, my check passed. So I can now merge this. And back over in drone. Now my apply is running. So my previous job uh, pipeline ran off of the pull request. Now I've got an actual commit to master. So you'll see, still got the same files change step. Still got the same AWS credential step, uh, but now um, I have a push step for a push to the master branch. So if I hit the play button and watch the output, actually watch the supply. TF init, I believe, just kicked off each. Um, Step for it will be prepended with a uh, plus for each command, which is kind of nice. And it's applying now. So exactly what I expected. My VPC is terraformed in it and now it's there. So now to bring this down when I'm complete, I can just revert that pull request and destroy it. So uh, this is the repo I was just sharing. Um, I will, this is private at the moment, but I will make it public shortly after the talk. So where I had said the code for the drone role assumption on the account side was in the repo. Uh, this is the, this is the import, important pieces of that um, are the, the policy that uses the, uh, the, the, that external ID, um, and in the account where that's trusted. But again, the full example is in the repo. Uh, and then the server side of it, which is not in the repo, uh, is, is really just this. So this is what we do anytime a team comes to us and says, hey, I want to use this in my pipeline. We say, okay, 
put this into our config and then our, our agents are then, our agent instances are then able to assume roles into that account or ins assume that specific role into their account. Um, trying to go a bit faster. Um, so Kubernetes, I just wanted to mention um, some things about Kubernetes because I know this is a Kubernetes group. Uh, so we follow a very similar process uh, for our Kubernetes deployments where we have uh, dev and prod in separate directories in the same, um, of course, not a Terraform GitHub repository, but a separate you know, Kubernetes repository for our team and where we've structured it something like this and we'll you know, run things like Prometheus Thanos, Grafana, that sort of thing. Um, so that it works very well for us in, in both uh, scenarios. And the other cool thing I wanted to share, and, and so if, if drone looks interesting to you and uh, maybe you're already running a Kubernetes cluster, um, where I had mentioned there's multiple runners, where what I was sharing before, that whole process uses the Docker runner, um, which runs steps in Docker images on an instance, uh, this new runner, um, the cube runner, will run uh, steps in your pipeline as pods in your cluster. So unfortunately, this is still beta, but we've played around with it and it looks really promising. So I wanted to mention it here in case, uh, in case it seemed interesting to people. Uh, and this is what uh, the, the important line in a uh, Kubernetes or in a cube runner pipeline would be you'd set the type to Kubernetes instead of type Docker, and then uh, your drone server would know where to send that pipeline. Um, what else? Oh, um, so we were, if you use the Kubernetes Terraform provider, then it's a very similar workflow. Uh, you wouldn't have you know, things like the, the regions probably, um, or maybe you would, depending on how you set things up. But yeah, it could be a very similar process, uh, potentially, if you're using the Terraform Kubernetes provider. Um, yeah, and again, if you want to find me, I'm on Twitter, I'm on GitHub, and that repo again is there up in uh, beneath my name, and I'll share that afterwards. And a couple quick extra things I wanted to mention because it could help. Uh, our the team that I work in has been writing some um, tutorials using Katacoda. They were recently bought by O'Reilly. I don't know what their future looks like, but uh, these, these tutorials are at least up there for now. Uh, they're free. We usually share these with our teams, but they could be useful to anyone. Uh, so we have tutorials on drone if you've never used drone, uh, and we have a tutorial on uh, Terraform as well. Um, if you are interested in following what we're doing in Meltwater Engineering, we have an official blog at underthehood.meltwater.com. Um, so lots going on there. And with that, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for having you, Jim. It was very, very interesting. Um, I collected all the questions. I will just copy and paste them here um, in the chat because there were a lot of conversation ongoing. So maybe you can oh. just have a look over it. Um, you already mentioned that you will share the slides afterwards. Uh, will you publish them in the um, meetup event? Yes, I can give them to you or can I? Yeah. Okay, so I just dropped all the questions from the beginning until the end there. So maybe you can have a look over it. Okay, have a look in the chat. Um, how to handle Terraform imports. Uh, we do Terraform imports sometimes, and that would be local. So we would, uh, we do have our own um, IAM uh, authentication locally, you know, with, uh, with roles and with MFA as secure as we can make it, um, where we can run Terraform locally. We try, you know, for, for imports, um, you're, you're importing infrastructure that's already up in your account. So it's not a matter of you know, trying to apply something really locally and bring up infrastructure, it's something that's already there. So we would, um, yeah, so we would go into the 
necessary structure and uh, and run the, run the import there, and which would then get the get it into our state file, and then we'd have to write the Terraform that, that's associated with it, and then that would go up into a pull request and likely be a you know no I know what no your infrastructure is up to date you'd see because it wouldn't actually be changing anything. Um, and how do you rename and move resources? Um, TF state move, I have never used. So I don't know. I will look into that. Move and rename resources. Hmm. Normally, if I've never seen that command, so I look into it. But if uh, our normal process would usually be uh, bringing up new infrastructure and moving things over to it. You know, hopefully we, hopefully it's something we have a load balancer in front of and we can uh, start sending traffic to it and then tear down the old infrastructure. But if there's ways to somehow move name, like if names, I'm assuming, I'm gonna make some assumptions of what that command does. Maybe it lets you rename uh, your infrastructure um, in, in ways that would normally result in a destructive process. So that sounds really interesting to look into that. Um, more questions coming in. Yeah, more questions coming in. <laughs> and yeah. so a lot of questions are not answered. Great. So um, yeah, just feel free to answer a few more questions. And um, if you have still open questions, you can always like ping Jim like on Twitter or whatever and ask him all your questions you have or that's fine or not Jim. <laughs> that's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so Istio, I'm not sure how they're handling it. I know that they use COPS to manage this, the, the cluster. So uh, I'm assuming from, and I know they don't use the Terraform provider. I believe right now we are the only team that's been playing around with and actually using the Terraform provider for Kubernetes. I know they're, they're doing everything in YAML. Although we have other teams using uh, Helm, um, yeah, a lot of people love Helm. And as long as Docker in Docker is not involved, build container, ease build automation. Oh, unfortunately, it's possible. It's not a problem. Or exchange. I think um, there's a comment from Luigi around building containers, probably within Kubernetes. And I think that's a valid concern. Uh, you, at the moment, I mean, I know there's projects for building Docker images without having access to the Docker socket. Um, something I didn't mention in the talk is uh, trusted repos. So we trust our engineers. We trust, uh, you know, if you're in our GitHub organization, if you have a private repository in Meltwater, um, that we will actually automatically trust your repository so it's allowed to use the Docker socket. Um, that's, so that's the way we get around it, is that we have a level of trust expectation. And yeah, teams can then build their own, a full access to the Docker socket. Um, but yeah, in Kubernetes, that would be another challenge. How do you deploy? And uh, Manuel says, how do you deploy a application into this generated arch using the Helm provider, ETF or something else? Mm, not sure if I understand that question. How do you deploy an application? Um, sorry, Emmanuel's question, I don't quite understand. Uh, this question, is drone open source? Yes, uh, I believe there are some components that are not, which are only available in the enterprise version, but I, yeah, it is, it is, open, it is free for open source projects to run on their own. And multi, Werner says, if you are not in a multi-stage environment, would drone help um, or be overhead compared to other CI solutions like Travis? Um, you're not multi-stage. So, I mean, there's no reason, if you're not in multi-stage, no reason to have multiple stages. Um, I, we have, so actually we, there was a time in Meltwater where uh, before we ran drone, there teams ran either their own Jenkins or they used Travis or Circle and things were really spread out. Um, and there were a lot of, um, 
there were there was a lot that teams still wanted out of the CI CD solution that, that they weren't getting. So um, drone really, like I was saying, just took off once we first offered it uh, very organically. So so Travis CI specifically, like we had a lot of teams move off of tra Travis CI very quickly because uh, they had a much better experience in drone. So I, I don't see it, uh, that, um, yeah, any, any additional overhead would be significant. Um, how do you handle apply failures? Ooh, that's a good one that I forgot to mention. So apply failures for us, uh, for our team, we decided that when, if you merge the master branch and the apply fails, you get alerted. Uh, you actually get paged. Um, because that's very important to us that our master branch actually reflects what's really running. So as soon as an apply fails, that's not true anymore. Uh, and then we kind of, that person is expected to drop everything and fix it. Uh, so to apply failures, um, you know, first of all, you get alerted and then you start fixing it. Uh, and then hopefully through the same kind of process, if you, if for whatever reason there was like permissions thing or, or, or a race condition or something that didn't actually need a change uh, pushed, you can hit the uh, restart on the job failed and it will rerun at the same commit revision. Uh, I'm not sure how much more time we have, but I'm totally happy answering more questions. Sure, I mean, there's no rush for my side as well. Um, okay. I just asked the the, the, the people to, to ask any questions if they still open again, because I think now um, scrolling up all the time is a bit yeah. difficult. So I'm catching the ones that I see at the time I look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so. they're coming now a lot more, so yeah. feel free. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, I like this big block from Jeffrey. Yep. Uh, so the slide deck, yeah, the slides will be shared. Um, why drone and not Jenkins? I briefly just mentioned um, Jenkins and not AWS. So we've used uh, Code Pipeline. Um, Code Pipeline was fine. Uh, Code Pipeline worked really well. And actually, we had a solution that was specific to Terraform in Code Pipeline that we provided as a cloud formation template. Like to, for people that didn't have any Terraform yet, like here, run this CloudFormation template, it'll set up a code pipeline for you, and, uh, and then you can start running your Terraform. It was a very, the idea was it was gonna be a low barrier to entry uh, to running things under CI. So that worked fine, as for, but the visibility was only for the team that could get into uh, code pipeline. So we don't have, um, there is no expectation in Nutwater that if you're on one team that you can view another team's account. So if a team had a code pipeline, uh, in one of their accounts, it's basically isn't visible to any other team. They would have to, you know, set up uh, access manually to to let that other user in to see that code pipeline. Where uh, drone is uh, available to everyone in our GitHub organization. So that was the big thing about uh, not using code pipeline. Um, Jenkins, we ran Jenkins for a long time. There are still teams running Jenkins uh, for certain things. We actually just had a meeting with the one of our biggest teams around how they use their Jenkins. Um, they would like to move to drone, but they've written so many customizations that it's not practical at the moment. Um, but they would like to not have the overhead of running their own Jenkins. So the big um, issue for us with Jenkins was uh, that we teams were always, and maybe this has changed. Things are always changing in the Jenkins world. Uh, but at the, at the time, you know, we would run an agent somewhere and if some new dependency was needed, so Docker was not involved. Maybe there's ways to make uh, Docker more integrated into Jenkins these days, but you could not easily run a step um, in Docker. So they it would be a matter of, oh, I have this new dependency that I need uh, for my team on this agent. Can you please install it? Um, or you know that the dependency you installed for other, that other team broke my stuff. Why'd you do that? You know, it was just a constant, you know nightmare of, uh, of trying to manage that. And then the actual configurations themselves lived, you know, in one place. Like I, I did use the Jenkins DSL at, at one time to generate jobs and, and that worked okay. But um, I mean, it's, it's such a better experience for our engineers to have 
a drone YAML in the root of their repository, just like Travis and Circle support, which is, uh, you know, it puts everything in their hands. They don't um, have to, we're not a blocker. We're not, they don't have to come to us for changes to what their workflow needs. Um, so, and uh, I'm gonna have to skip questions. It's just so many. How do you handle module call deletions? It needs Terraform to destroy explicitly. Um, that hasn't, hasn't been my experience. If you, if I have a module uh, defined in a .tf file, if I just rename or remove that .tf file, that module and everything that was managed beneath it gets destroyed. So maybe there's another, or maybe I'm missing something, but um, how do you prevent uh, from, from secret? How do you prevent uh, a team A to use AWS account from team B? Um, they, the, the easy answer is they have no access to accounts for other teams. They, uh, and they have full access actually for who they, how they set up their IAM users and um, who they allow into their account. Um, so we, we give our teams a lot of autonomy and it's a lot of, uh, you know, at times challenging for teams with less experience in the cloud, which is, which is where we come in. We, you know, we work with teams a lot to get their comfort level up so that they're, uh, they're comfortable with all the process that they need to run their infrastructure. Um, you know, it's just some good discussion going on. <laughs> yes, your talk is very good, so. I'm thrilled, great, thanks guys. Thank you everyone. Um, how do you do dev test branches? Oh. That's a good question. Branches. So um, we have another rec. So what I shared was a single branch. Um, and so that's our default we go with. That we see that, hey, you're just getting started. We recommend this. But we also say, hey, you can do this in a branching model um, where you have like a development branch, maybe a staging branch, and then production. Uh, we have followed that before, and we have some teams following that now. We abandoned it because it effectively became a one lane road. Once you got a change into development that wasn't ready for you know, the next uh, level, then you were a blocker to anyone else who wanted to get something off to the next, uh, to the next branch. Unless you tried to then go in and do some cherry picking of commits, which was just not a fun experience ever. Um, so we, we, yeah. That was actually back in the time uh, where we were doing a lot of work together with the European team and we were just constantly annoying each other with changes that weren't ready to go off to, uh, to, the, next, uh, to the next step. So you absolutely can do it. Um, branching works. Uh, there's, there's no reason not to other than, you know, as long as you, you're managing that, that one lane road well, uh, it can work fine. What we've seen is it works pretty well for, uh, for certain projects. Like this Terraform direct or this Terraform uh, repository manages this specific project. No other projects, then you know, then it, then it works pretty well. Um, anything else? Anything else? Um, Uh, Cross-region resources is another great question. The directory structure I shared at first did have like EUS one and US East one as examples, I think. Uh, so we, at the moment, we are we don't do very much cross-region, so I don't have uh, much for examples. But the idea would be that you would have uh, similar structures <clears throat> between. Because AWS treats their regions um, as uh, independently, so we would want to keep our code independent, also. Uh, which you know, once we start doing that more, might become more painful. Where oh, I need to get a change out, and it means I need to change, you know, four directories structures or something, where um, each directory is for a different region. Like that might get uh, that might get old fast. <laughs> so we. We may 
you know, come up with other ways to do that where we were doing sim lengths or modules or something by where, whereby changing one would mean uh, it would automatically change others. So um, someone asked why not just have several region specific providers in the same module. Um, that's probably fine. Yeah, um, that, that could be a solution to work around uh, if we felt that was painful. Uh, that could be a potential solution, just build everything into a module. Can't think of anything horrible about that at the moment, but it could work. Um, how do you manage cross state dependencies? Uh, we do de we do like outputs in our state files that are then that then become dependencies of other uh, infrastructure and and maybe you know what I bet you're asking how do you maybe you're asking um, if you change multiple directories which this model does support you can go into like dev and prod hopefully you're not doing that hopefully you're doing dev first and then prod separately um, you could uh, change multiple directories and you would be right that there is no precedence at the moment um, we don't have a good workflow for, oh, I need to change multiple directories and they need to be applied in this order. Other than if you had named the directories, uh, you know, alphabetically or something, then, then they would effectively go in order. But, um, but yeah, that would be a good improvement to have. Yeah, well, we're over an hour. Great, thanks so much again. Um, yeah, I think this talk was very, very interesting for all of them. So, okay. um, yeah, as I already mentioned, uh, we will um, publish a recording and share the slides with all of you. So, um, yeah, if you have any further questions, just, yeah, you have to ping Jim separately or privately. <laughs> uh, you have then uh, his contact details. So, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Jim, for, for presenting and sharing your knowledge. So that's actually from our side then. And yeah, I wish some of you a good night for you, John. Good night <laughs> for some <laughs> of the rest. Have a good day. Um, so it's ours very interesting from what time zone the people are actually joining. Um, yeah. So have a good one. Thank you very much, everyone. Hey. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you in person sometime. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.